Hi, I'm Shannon McKinnon, host and media producer at Cybercrime Radio. Welcome to Let's Talk SOC, a cybercrime magazine podcast series brought to you by SecureWorks, a leader in cybersecurity, empowering security and IT teams worldwide to accelerate effective security operations. Joining me today is Troy Betancourt, who is the Director and Delivery Manager of Incident Response for SecureWorks. We're talking today about business email compromise. Hi, Troy. Welcome to the show. Hi, Shannon. Thank you very much for having me. Troy, can you tell our audience just a little bit about yourself before we get started? Certainly. I've been with SecureWorks for a bit over six years now. For the past year, I've been one of the managers of our North American Emergency Incident Response Practice, a role I share with one other co-manager. Together, we oversee six teams in North America that are responsible for incident response efforts supporting existing clients as well as net new clients who call our emergency hotline when in distress. We also have other globally dispersed teams that report to fellow managers in their respective geographical regions. Prior to moving back into a management role, I spent about five years as an emergency incident response consultant, much of that as the senior most consultant here at SecureWorks. And then before joining SecureWorks, the bulk of my work in this field was as a special agent for two different US federal agencies. And the bulk of that work focused on digital forensics, incident response, and e-discovery efforts. Wow. So that we're all on the same page here, can you tell us what business email compromise is? Certainly. A business email compromise, commonly referred to as a BEC, is essentially when a threat actor compromises a user's business email account and then uses that account to send fraudulent emails to others. These recipients could be external or internal or both. And the threat actor does this for purposes of financial fraud. In my experience, the two most common approaches to stealing money via this method are first, inserting themselves into an existing email chain with a vendor or some other party that involves payment of some sort. Think like invoicing, things of that nature. The threat actor acts as though they're the employee whose account they compromised. They insert themselves into the chain and then they reply back to the existing email chain and change payment information, usually bank account routing information to redirect the payments to an account they control. And sometimes they'll increase the actual amount due as well. They commonly do this by finding email chains that reference some sort of invoice and then maybe editing it if it's an attached PDF to reflect the new information or sometimes just right in the body of the email saying, you know, we've increased the amount and here's our new bank account information. So in this particular type of attack, the compromised account could be one of your own employees or actually it could be the third party that you are communicating with and that compromised account from the third party is then used to target your organization. As you can imagine, the former is easier to prevent when it's your own company because you can secure your environment, you can train your employees. The latter is a bit more hard to prevent because it's one of your business partners who's compromised. The second most common approach that I see or we see is C-level fraud. And this is usually when a threat actor compromises a key executive's email account and then sends emails to accounting or finance folks or maybe administrative assistants, people that have the ability to make payments of some sort and direct them to send funds to a threat actor's bank account. It's often phrased or under the guise of some sort of emergency. The CEO's on the road and needs this cash. An M&A is about to fall apart if we don't deposit cash somewhere. Large vendors upset about a payment they haven't received. And this whole sense of urgency is just used to create pressure on the targeted employee to react quickly without recognizing signs of any potential red flags. How often does it work? It's a good question. You know, we certainly have a bias on our end because we're only contacted when it works. So every time we see it, it works, unfortunately. (laughs) But uh, we, we obviously don't know the amount of times that it fails. What do you think the most effective technical control? to prevent BECs actually is? Hands down, it's multi-factor authentication or MFA. It's the most effective control to prevent BECs. And according to Microsoft themselves, this is their quote, by providing an extra barrier and layer of security that makes it incredibly difficult for attackers to get past, MFA can block over 99.9% of account compromise attacks, end quote. So obviously 99.9% is a pretty staggering number. And while this chat's focused only on BECs, MFA also prevents a lot of other type attacks if they're credential-based. So think, you know, if you have remote desktop protocol, VPN, Citrix, et cetera, that's exposed on the internet, that 
it is only relying on user and password to access, that's a pretty low hanging fruit for a threat actor to compromise. And by implementing MFA, while it's not 100%, it certainly will reduce your threat exposure. What about other technical controls? I get that that does the bulk 99.9%, but what's going to do the other (laughs) 0.01%? Sure, great question. So just like security controls in general in our space, it's all about defense and depth. And MFA shouldn't be relied on as the one-stop solution. Inevitably, a control is going to fail. It was configured wrong. The technology fails. Something happens. And the idea is that if you have layered controls, even if a threat actor defeats one, in order to further advance their efforts, they would trip on another one. And if they hit that trip wire, that early detection is really key to responding before, you know, in this case, you lose money due to financial fraud, or in other cases, you don't have ransomware deployed, let's say. So... This is usually a credential-based attack that the user's password is stolen and then used to access email to facilitate fraud. So often the initial compromise of those accounts comes in the form of a phishing email. And that phishing email directs the user to a fake login page. And that login page is designed to harvest their credentials. So it'll look like maybe um, an O365 logon page. Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, Adobe, DocuSign, et cetera, whatever fits the phishing lore they use. And the idea is a user would think it's legitimate, get redirected. Everyone's used to now having to log on to these web-based portals, put in their credentials, and now the threat actor harvests it. Some of the more advanced ones actually will harvest the MFA codes as well. And then the threat actor can try to use that, and that'll defeat MFA to some extent. So some additional ways to stop this is first is deploy a web filter solution. Essentially what that will do is block known bad websites. So if this is a known phishing website, it'll block it. An additional function many of these have is to block websites that haven't yet been scored for a reputation. Sometimes they're called no reputation, uncategorized. Each vendor is a little different. And this is really important because the threat actors constantly rotate their infrastructure because As soon as they get classified as malware, then they're blocked. So they'll rotate, not daily necessarily, but maybe weekly or every few weeks. So their new infrastructure does not yet have a reputation and that will let them get through a lot of these filters. So if you block no reputation websites, then these types of attacks can be somewhat thwarted as well. This can impact business operations a bit, depending on what business vertical you're in. So if you do something like this, a planned and deliberative implementation with tunings recommended. Another easy one, or I say easy, it's relatively easy, is that some of your email security solutions can neuter or redirect hyperlinks that are in emails. So if a user does click on it, they won't automatically be taken to the website. There might be a secondary action they have to take or IT has to take to release that link and allow the user to go there. So it can also be disruptive to normal business, but I've seen organizations that have successfully implemented and some of them are quite large. And then another control, again, none of these are 100% is geo-blocking. And this is where you block logins from countries where your users would not normally be located. So if you're just a domestic organization, that can be easier to do. When you're international, it obviously can be much more challenging, but if you do have particular countries, especially if they're known to be high threat countries, and you don't have a point of presence there, then you might be able to block those as well. Again, still can cause issues. Maybe someone travels to a country either for business or for pleasure and wants to check email or access corporate resources. And if they're in a banned country, that can be problematic. And then threat actors can defeat this by using VPN services or open proxies in the same country as the target. So let's say you're a UK-based country they know that they could use a UK-based VPN service and geoblocking wouldn't work. But again, it's a defense in depth type approach. Disabling legacy authentication methods. This is really big as we've moved to cloud-based services, you know, O365 or Office 365 and their corresponding suite sort of being the big player in the space. Legacy authentication methods, many folks may know them like IMAP and POP when you configure your webmail, don't support MFA by themselves. And that's commonly what's used by Outlook and native email apps on your mobile devices. So you can disable that entirely, or if that's not possible, you can leverage what's in Office 365 is known as conditional access. You'll grant access to these old methods, but based upon conditions. One of the conditions might be that 
the device that is connecting to webmail has to have been enrolled in your device management solution. So presumably the threat actor's computer has not been enrolled in your corporate environment. And if they try to access it, it's not a registered device and they would not be able to use those credentials. Another one that is really trivial to do and provides really great early alerting is blocking or alerting upon email forwarding rules that send emails outside of your environment. So think a user receives emails to their corporate environment and the rules automatically forward those messages out of the environment, perhaps to a personal email address, or in this case, a threat actor controlled one. Most organizations don't want people forwarding internal emails to personal addresses anyways, so this is usually not impactful. And if you alert upon this activity, this very quickly will let you know that in this case, a threat actor has already fished credentials and has logged into an account and is trying to manipulate it. So this can provide early detection before the threat actor is able to commit their fraud. Another common rule is to move messages to odd mailbox folders. For O365, Outlook, your traditional Microsoft email, there's a folder by default called RSS feeds. I've been in this space for quite a few years, and I've only seen one user <laughs> legitimately move stuff to that folder with a rule. So it's pretty high fidelity that if you see a rule that routes to this folder, that it's at the very least suspicious, if not malicious. Right. And the reason threat actors do that is because once they've injected themselves into this chain and they're communicating now, pretending to be the compromised user, they don't want the real user to see the responses. So they'll set up the rule that if an email comes in matching a pattern of their fraudulent email, it automatically gets hidden from the regular user. Last is just shoring up your MFA. And part of that is through user behavior. So, you know, MFA was great at first. We implemented it, really caused a lot of problems for threat actors. But now threat actors are targeting the user because that's one of your points of weakness. And they'll do what we call MFA request bombing. So they'll try to log in and MFA is required. So they'll say, sure, let's do an MFA push. Now the user gets a notification probably on their mobile device and thinks, well, I didn't do anything. So they deny it. Well, the threat actor will just keep doing that until either the user gets frustrated because it's three in the morning and they want it to stop. Or they think, oh, you know, I probably just need to, you know, my session to O365 expired. I just need to accept this. And eventually the threat actor will get in because the user will let them in. So that's more of a user education but it couples with the technical control. And then the last newest thing that we've seen with MFA is that you can get a prompt that also shows a map where the user's logging in from. So again, if this is a foreign threat actor and a user sees a prompt from not the country where they're located, hopefully they would recognize that and they would not accept the MFA request. Troy, these are all great technical strategies that you're giving us here. Are there any non-technical things that can be done to prevent BECs? For sure, and a great question. So as we know, we can layer as many technical controls as possible, but user behavior is really the hardest to predict and to control. And users are often key contributors to security failures, unintentionally and with best intentions, but still contribute to the failures. So the earlier one I mentioned, coupling a technical control like MFA with showing a map or requiring a user to manually type in a number to accept the MFA request, that can go a long way. So that's a combination of technical and user education. Two other non-technical controls are to implement a two-person rule. And this really comes from traditional fraud, not even cyber-associated fraud. So the two-person rule or telephonic in-person verification rules. So the two-person rule requires that any changes to payment information must be confirmed with a second employee. So basically a sanity check. So if there's some sort of urgency in the email trying to get a user to fall victim, just asking a colleague might be enough to identify red flags. In some organizations, they do this for all changes. Some, it doesn't scale well, so they might set a monetary threshold for when checks are required. And then the second one, the telephonic or in-person verification requires employees to actually contact the requester to verify that they should change the account information. Now, of course, you don't want to just email them back because it could be a threat actor. And you certainly don't want to call a phone number and a signature because the threat actor sent you the email. So you'd want to use either an internal employee directory or a CRM or vendor management solution, or even the vendor's website to get the contact information. 
I happen to know of multiple BECs we've worked where the victim business was defrauded of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even with no technical controls, just having these two non-technical controls in place would have stopped the fraud. And then the last one is encourage a culture where your lower level employees are encouraged to challenge C-level or outside requests for what they view as maybe non-standard changes without any fear of retribution. If you can encourage even your junior folks to challenge these requests, that could be just that early detection that's enough to stop the fraud. And these are really the most effective measures, both technical and non-technical, that we've seen to combat BDCs. These are fantastic tips, Troy. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for your time, Shannon. I greatly appreciate it. 